Hello and welcome to the UNB Law Podcast. My name is Michael Marin and I'm the Dean of Law at UNB. We begin all of our events by recognizing and respectfully acknowledging that the UNB Law community gathers on the unsurrendered and unceded traditional lands of Wolustiqui. Today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with Patricia Bernard, a graduate of the UNB Law class of 1999. Chief Bernard's life and career are characterized by tireless service to her community and advocacy on behalf of Indigenous peoples of New Brunswick. Chief Bernard is from the Madawaska Maliseet First Nation in Northwestern New Brunswick. She is the first Wallistiquay woman to earn a law degree. Chief Bernard was called to the New Brunswick Bar in 2000, and between 2000 and 2006, she worked for the federal government in the specific claims branch in Ottawa and in governance and registration with Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada in Amherst. In 2007, Chief Bernard became a counselor in her community and was elected chief in 2013. Chief Bernard was instrumental in resolving a specific land claim on behalf of your community, her community, a 23-year struggle that earlier this year resulted in the largest settlement of its kind in the history of the Maritimes. Chief Bernard was also a driving force behind uniting the Wallustaquay Nation in New Brunswick. She's also known for her successes in economic development through the Grey Rock Power Centre, a major retail property on the border of Maine and Quebec, the Madawaska Malaspi First Nation is a major economic player employing hundreds of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. In 2019, Chief Bernard was awarded the Order of New Brunswick, the province's highest honour. Chief Bernard, thank you so much for joining us, for joining us on the UNB Law podcast. It's really a pleasure to have you on and I'm looking forward to our conversation. You're welcome, Dean Marin. Glad to be here. Uh, that's great. So we usually start these discussions by talking about life before law school. Um, can you tell me a bit about your upbringing, where you were born, where you grew up and that sort of thing? Sure. Um, my uh, my father uh, is a member of the uh, Madawaska community and he was born here. Um, and he, when he reached around 17, 18, unfortunately, uh, racism was quite quite active in the area, and jobs were scarce for um, Indigenous people living in the community. So my dad decided, like many others, uh, to go into the U.S., down into New England, uh, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. And uh, so that's where my dad ended up, uh, in Massachusetts. And that's where he uh, met my mother. Um, they got married, and they had seven children. And so I'm the youngest of seven. Uh, I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and um, but my grandfather fell ill, so they uh, my des my dad decided to move back with uh, with the whole family. So and I was three years old at the time, so we moved back in 1971, and uh, I grew up on the reserve, um, and uh, and then I went to school here in the Edmonton area, and uh, and then from there. Um, I moved to, I, I actually went to school, high school in Madawaska, Maine. So I used to cross the border every day from grade nine to grade 12. And I, um, uh, I did get my high school diploma in uh, Madawaska, Maine, and I didn't go to the local uh, high school here. So that's interesting. How, how did that work practically? Like, was it a border crossing like a, like we're used to, or was there some kind of special arrangement where there's students going back and forth to the school there? How did that work? Uh, I mean, I was the youngest of seven, and so my older siblings did go to school here, um, but my mother felt that um, my mother was American, and is American too, and or by yeah, dual citizen, but she felt that I would get a better education from the United States, and uh, she inquired, and I was able to uh, to go to school in uh, Madawaska uh, because I was born in the states. And so my sister and I, and there was another a young man from the ta from town whose mother was also American and wanted her son to uh, to go through the um, 
the U.S. system. So we crossed daily. It was oh. uh, customs officers knew knew who we were, and we crossed every day uh, back and forth. Um, and uh, so all my friends were over there. So not only would I cross for school, but I would cross you know, many different times on the weekend and and uh, uh, after school hours. So yeah, so it was very easy um, the, when, especially when they know you. After high school, I went to um, community college oh, in okay. Uh, Camelton. Okay. And I got a uh, medical transcription uh, diploma. Okay. And uh, so as soon as I, I got my diploma, I um, I got married and then I was uh, got pregnant. So I stayed home with my children for uh, about four years and I lived in the Camelton area. My husband was working at uh, the Athelville pulp mill. And when the pulp mill shut down, um, my, um, my husband at the time got transferred to Fredericton and I moved and I applied um, to, uh, to UNB. So I went to UNB uh, education in the education program. So I was one of the last students to get an education degree under the four year program that was offered. Hey. When I was in, edu- when I was in my education program, I specialized in history. Okay. So, uh, I did do an independent study with uh, Andrea Bear Nicholas, who was teaching out of St. Thomas. Okay, that's the connection to St. Thomas, that because that's kind of legendary, you know, as part of your your story, and 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 we'll get to that um, in a minute. So, so you studied education then, and then you, you had an opportunity to do this uh, independent uh, study at at, at St. Thomas, and then why did you choose to go to law school, or when when did that kind of uh, uh, sort of become a goal of yours? Well, I, it didn't, it wasn't sort of a, a, um, a childhood dream to be, to go to law school. In in fact, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I did know that history fascinated me. So when I did go into education, I focused and majored in history and, um, and secondary, uh, secondary school, not, not primary. So I was going to teach social studies because that's sort of the natural sort of, um, field to go in if you're if you're interested in history uh and when i did my student teaching uh i i was teaching social studies to grade nine students and it was not at all what i had thought it was going to be um grade nine students are not necessarily um they're at an awkward age and so it became more of a of a an exercise in keeping the class organized and calm, uh, discipline. And so it was not really what I necessarily wanted to do. I was wanting to teach history to people who were really into it. And, um, and so when I did that student teaching, I realized at that point that, you no, know, I, I don't want to be a teacher. So uh, I was living uh, with, uh, I had a roommate who had been applying, doing the LSATs and had applied to university. She said, "Oh, do your LSATs and let's let's apply together." So I did it, just not really, um, not really sort of thinking that that would follow through. And but it did. Wow. So um, so when I got accepted into law school, it's like, oh, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And um, and I knew at, from my uh, undergrad uh, degree that history and the law fascinated me to the point where I knew that when I went into law school that I was going to focus on Aboriginal law. Okay. And then, um, so, so what was, um, oftentimes lawyers uh, sort of remember their first day of law school. Do you, do you remember what that, what that was like? I mean, you had a, you, you just said you had a clear kind of picture of what you wanted to focus on. But do you remember what what the first day was was like for for you? Yeah, it was a bit overwhelming. It's a bit, um, you know, when you're younger and it can be intimidating. Um, And one of the things that stuck with me was uh, we went into the big hall um, and 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 we had a bit of a speech from some of the uh, professors at the time. And one of the speeches said, uh, you know, you're here because you're, um, you know, the elite and it was quite a, um, an aristocratic kind of speech. And, and, and one thing that resonated with me was, you know, you're not among the washed up masses. 
And I thought that was quite a strange um, introduction as, a, as it meant to sort of, I think, lift, lift the student's spirit about, wow, you got here, great job, you know, you're better than other people. So that was a little bit shocking uh, for me. Uh, but but it, it set the tone for, um, I think, for the, at the time, university was very much known as a uh, black letter law uh, university. If you want to be, you know, a litigator, if you really want to get into law, this is the place to be. And and it was known for that. And I think it, it when I was in university at the time, I think, you know how McLean's puts out the um, law school uh, ratings and, and UNB was known for that. So if you were yeah. looking to do more social justice stuff, UNB really wasn't the place to be. Um, but that was really where I kind of wanted to go. I didn't really want to be a litigating kind of lawyer. Um, so it was a, it was exciting at the same time and a bit of an eye opener for me. Um, but one of the things that really kept me um, going and interested in in the school was the camaraderie. I belonged to a class that was amazingly uh, friendly in an in a and you know law is very adversarial, right? It's all about opinions and taking sides and and interpreting and and the the, the class that we were with um, really was fantastic. They were very helpful and friendly. We weren't competing with each other. We were always helping each other. So I felt um, the students really made me feel welcomed, um, mo like uh, almost all the time, and 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 that was really what kept me going through law school. Yeah, because it, you know it can be. Uh, I mean, I remember when I went to law school. Um, uh, before law school, I had um, worked for a, a food bank, actually doing sort of anti-poverty advocacy and that sort of thing, and then. I very much had a social justice kind of vision for myself in, in law school. Uh, I went to a much bigger law school than, than UNB. I went to the U of O where you don't have that sort of you know, close-knit environment. And I, and I found the first year quite challenging because I, they weren't talking about the things that were interest, I was interested in or that I saw myself doing. I remember, you know, we spent several classes talking about a, a contract involving the sale of oats to feed horses, right? And, and I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm not interested in feeding horses. I'm interested in feeding people, you know, and I don't understand why we're talking about this. And um, so that must have been challenging for you because, you know, you uh, sort of had a clear vision of what you wanted to, to do. And, and, you know, the material uh, in the traditional kind of black letter curriculum doesn't really expose you to those things, at least not right away. Um, so aside from the support of your classmates, how, how, how did you handle that? Because I know that there are a lot of law students who face this same dilemma every year. Well, I think for me, I, I, I even though I, you know, going into law school kind of, I, I fell into it. Um, I did know that my interests lie with Aboriginal issues, history, and and Aboriginal law. So, in every course that you take, you can put almost every course, I should say, you can you can find an Aboriginal sort of law linkage. So, if you're taking family law, you can look at how the law is different. For or on, on reserve uh, situations. The same with bankruptcy and the Indian Act, how, how you know, uh, the personal, real and personal property of an Indian on reserve is, is not seizable. So every, every area of law, you can make that connection. And whenever there was a, a course that was available where I could do a paper, I always focused it on um, Aboriginal issues. So I was able to do that to keep my interest and my um, and and my motivation going, and it was quite interesting when I looked at um, you know different when you're looking at different jurisdictions, when you're looking at family law, as I said, bankruptcy law, constitutional law, everything you can make a connection uh, to indigenous issues, and uh, and that's a, a, a real property law and everything. So it that's what kept me going, and that was uh, 
that was a challenge, but, uh, but the yeah. professors that were uh, much more flexible would allow me to do papers uh, to, to, to fulfill that sort of, uh, that niche of, of my, my desire to look at uh, Aboriginal issues. Wow, that's, that's so, so in other words, I mean, if there's a lesson in that, maybe, you know, law students have a particular interest, shouldn't let themselves get kind of cast in a particular mold or feel kind of like um, restricted in terms of what the official curriculum says, but maybe you know, they can push beyond it a little bit and adapt it to what they're, they're interested in. I think, I think that's, that's good advice. And it sounds like what what you were able to do. Um, so then after graduating from UNB Law, you went to work for the federal government, right? Is that, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And then, so why did, why did you decide to, to do that? Well, uh, when, I, um, when I graduated from law school, I was trying to find an articling position. And surprisingly, I mean, I, I, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, I, I graduated in the top you know, half of the class. So I, I, uh, um, I, but I had trouble finding an articling position. And I, if I, if I can recall when I, I went to some interviews, when they had the, the interview, pro, like the, the day where you go and do a bunch of interviews. And, and I remember being interviewed by um, Irving and they were interested, but then they quickly got, I, I felt, I felt that there was something odd there. Now, maybe it was just me, but it just seemed to me that I, in my, as an indigenous woman, I didn't really fit in anybody's uh, ideal of an articling student. So I, I, I couldn't get an articling position. So I ended up uh, articling for, uh, for free uh, through the um, assistance of my community. So they helped me uh, through my articling, but I worked for, uh, for uh, George Filleter. I did my articles with him. And that was extremely fun because he, uh, he was, uh, he did, had a lot of indigenous, uh, files and, and, and so, we, and he allowed me some, uh, flexibility to work with some clients. So it, it was a really great experience, uh, working with him and, uh, and doing my articles with him. And so, but then I, you know, with no experience, I couldn't lay, you know, hang out a shingle or anything like that. And I, I had two young children and so I needed to find a job, and unfortunately, uh, I had to move to Ottawa. And I didn't want to move to Ottawa. I liked Fredericton. I liked staying there. But you have to go where the work is. And I had applied in a position um, at Specific Claims, and I got it. So I, I had no choice but to go out there. But it was, it was a great experience for me because even though I was hired as a, a, C, as a research analyst, um, it was in, in everything I loved to do. It was yeah. indigenous history, and I learned so much while I was there. And not just about, um, you know, I had already learned quite a bit about my home area in the in the Atlantic provinces, but I learned way a, a whole lot about um, the Western treaties and and the numbered treaties and and and. A lot of the claims in Ontario, because at one point I, I was promoted to senior advisor for Ontario claims. And so that was quite a learning experience. And it was it was amazing. And I um, I would never give that up because it was uh, a great experience for me. It was a little bit difficult because as a, as a research analyst, you what you're doing is you're assisting the First Nation in. Um, verifying their claim and doing additional research to see if there is an actual lawful breach. And when I was there, I had already submitted my claim. So they had put up the wall. I was not allowed to touch that claim at all, but it had sat there anyway. Um, there was a lot of turnover in spec claims. There was a lot of backlog and, uh, but, but it was, it was quite an experience for me to learn so much about the rest of history in Canada because uh, that's what we did. But again, a difficult part I was going to say is that what would also happen is lawyers would provide opinions on the research. And then as the research and as senior analyst, I would have to review that and ask questions. And it was a little bit of a challenge, I think, for some of the lawyers there because I had some legal training and I was questioning their legal findings and I quickly got um, scolded back into, well, you're not a lawyer, you're 
a research analyst. And at one point I did, I remember having a battle with one of the lawyers um, about the Royal Proclamation. And, um, and I was pretty much told, well, you should just go back and do your thesis. If that's what, what you believe, do a master's thesis on, the, on the, on a disagreement that I had about the Royal Proclamation, but, but it's, it was quite a challenge. It was really, really useful for me. And, and I really enjoyed my time there. One of the things that I find so instructive about this um, part of your story is that, you know, as you describe it, you didn't really, you, you, you weren't eager to leave Fredericton. You, you went to Ottawa because that's where the opportunity was. Um, but, you know, hearing you talk about what you learned there and also knowing something about what happened after, I mean, this, this was, you know, must have been uh, so important for your development and your knowledge and training and even those fights with the lawyers, correct me if I'm wrong, but you probably learned about the way that they think, right? And the arguments that they make and, and, and that maybe made you a more effective advocate. Is that, is that well, right? Well, it's, it's not, it may be a bit cliche, but you know the saying, know thy enemy, because, um, it, it was. It was extremely helpful. But I, I I wasn't working in negotiation. Negotiation is a separate part of the spec claims. I was in the research part, which was way more um, friendly and and helpful. Uh, so you're you're helping the First Nation uh, do the research. You're hiring additional researchers, and it it was it was fantastic. I I really did enjoy it. But yeah, it's it is kind of. Um, funny how uh, that all unfolded and, and uh, how I was able to be there, which kept my um, interest in the current claim that we had, that we had submitted, that I had submitted back in 98, that it, 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 it re-justified re my, um, my faith in, in, in the position that I held with respect to the claim. And, and, and when did you come back to New Brunswick? Well, uh, what happened was when, while I was working uh, in in um, Ottawa, there was a chance for a secondment to Amherst. So I thought, why not? You know, I go back to uh, you know the community uh, to my community. So I I left spec claims and went into um, governance and registration and, and estates and and uh, and that worked out quite well for me. It was a one year secondment and. And so I went to work in Amherst for a year and I learned quite a bit there about more of more of like uh, indigenous services than um, than anything else. And that was uh, quite helpful for me. I got to become more familiar with the communities and, uh, you know, helped with bylaws and membership and estates and wills and estates on reserve. So th that that was quite a, a year for me. Um, and so uh, while I was there, uh, my sister was the chief here, and she said, you know, Trish, you should come and work in the community and, and help us with the bylaws and, and help us with policies and let's get some good governance. And so I took her up on that. And so it was a, um, it was a, a, a big decision to leave the federal government because I had a pension and uh, I was only there for five years, but it's, it's, when you go to work for a First Nation, you have to ask yourself, okay, is this a temporary position? Am I there for the long haul? Um, but I had the faith that, uh, that I could definitely do good things for the community. And I thought, you know what, this is my opportunity. And so I left the federal government and uh, worked and be got hired full time um, with the community. I was on a contract for a year, but then got hired full time after that. And then you eventually became a counselor as well. Is that is that right? Yeah. So I worked for I, I came to work for the First Nation on a contract in two thousand and five. I I uh, in two thousand and six I became a full time employee, and then I became a counselor in two thousand and seven. So some of our our listeners and, and students might not be familiar with um, the governance structure of uh, First Nations communities. Can, can you explain the role of the, 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 the council and the chief and the councillors and how that all works? Sure. So we, we're from like a small community. So um, 
at first we we were going under our elections by the Indian Act. So under the Indian Act, for every 100 members, there's a councillor. So you have a minimum of two councillors and a maximum of 12 councillors. And then there's a chief. And the role of councillors really is to uh, deal with the internal workings of the community when it comes to policies and things like that. The chief is really the spokesperson, um, takes direction from the council, um, Right now, we still have two council members because we switched from the Indian Act to the First Nations uh, Elections Act. Um, and you can, if you're at, you can actually change the amount of councillors depending on what you need. So we felt that a small uh, chief and council group were was much more productive than if we started to add councillors because the more councillors you add, uh, the harder it is to get a consensus, the harder it is to to make decisions. It's more time consuming. And so we, we liked having the small council uh, in place. And when I became a councillor in 2007, we had a female chief and two female councillors. And since 2007, it's always been female councillors and chiefs. Wow. So, yeah, so that has, um, has actually been a, quite a... Um, and I like to say women are really good at multitasking. And so we worked well together uh, as a now you get to remember we're a small community. So we're related to everyone. Um, like the, right, right now, I mean, we like my one of the counselors is my husband's cousin and I work with uh, my sisters and I work with my cousins and my husband's cousins and my children. And so, you know, normally you go into an office and you're you're pretty much separated from the people in your office, but if 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 they're not related to me in the office, well, I babysat them, I grew up with them, they're my neighbors, so it's a it's a unique uh, type of experience to work in a band office community because, I mean, I, you may you may have a colleague next door in your office, um, but likely that you didn't change their diapers, and it's likely that you don't know everything about their life. So I think um, the the biggest challenge will is the conflict of interest uh, challenge that we have because we are related to everybody and we're very closely connected to everyone. And so it, it's almost impossible for decisions to be made if you're going to declare conflict um, with everyone because we're, we're related to everyone. And uh, so we, we've narrowed down our, our uh, conflict of interest policy to be uh, parents, spouse, and children. And that's it. So we don't declare conflict conflicts for nephews and siblings and uncles, and because it, it, it I wouldn't be able to make any decisions. <laughs> and and so it becomes it, it that becomes a challenge in itself. But um, but decisions are made at a at, you know duly convened band council meetings. Uh, the chief is always the chair and doesn't vote unless there's a tie. So uh, decisions are made mostly by consensus with, with the councillors. Um, the thing is, the chief is the one that ends up uh, announcing decisions. And so, you know, you, the chief ends up being either the, the, the gets all the credit for everything or all the blame for everything. And that's, you know, that's what being a politician is about, really. Uh, and it's, it's, it's challenging, but it's, uh, it's very, very yeah, well, I want to ask you a little bit more about that because, um, you know, it seems to me like in an environment like that, uh, where you know everyone so well and you're familiar with everyone, um, your highs can be really, really high, right? Because you're, the, you're so close with these people, but your lows can also be really low. Um, how do you manage that, uh, you know, and, and, and sort of stay um, motivated through the times when maybe things are, uh, are low, but also kind of grounded when the things are, are high? You, and that's, that's an excellent point, because a lot of people don't quite necessarily realize that, especially like if you're a politician, a lot of people can criticize you, but you don't know them. And, you know, if you, you know, you have to have a tough skin and you have to be able to handle those things. But when it's your cousins and your neighbors and your parents or your family criticizing you, it becomes, it can be, it can be tough. 
And it's a stressful position uh, because you can't please everyone. And that's the way it is. You end up making decisions where someone is going to be disappointed. And, and those are, those are the challenging times and you have to really balance that with your mental health and home life. So for example, in our community, we work four days a week, uh, which is almost a necessity and we can, we can strive and do very well, uh, and be very productive on four days a week. than if we were to work five days a week and as our mental health is improved by that, um, and, you know, we offer a lot of benefits. We, we don't have any unions in, in our office, but, but we provide uh, tremendous amounts of benefits and time off and, and things of that nature. So, so it's really about balance and it's really no different, I think, than uh, other jobs. But uh, legal jobs can be quite demanding when billable hours are, are really a, a concern. But it's, you know, we're moving more towards mental health and keeping ourselves uh, sane and not getting overstressed because that could easily happen. Do, do you think like in your work, if there is a decision that, um, that council is going to make or, or something you're going to say or do is going to be controversial, um, how important is it that your constituents understand why you're making that, that decision. Like, does it help at all, uh, you know, deal with the controversy and the criticism if you are kind of explaining the why, you know? if if Because I find that sometimes leaders are reluctant to explain the why and really be transparent. And they, you know, they engage in sort of spin or they get defensive and this this kind of thing. And, and that just makes the critics, right, even more kind of in, in, intense in their criticism and it stifles kind of understanding. And I, I often wonder if it's realistic or possible for leaders and, and, and politicians, people in, in, in situations like yours, would it help and does it help if your constituents know the why, even if they disagree with you? Oh, absolutely. And I think that's the key. And, and we are very open and transparent. Um, we, have, um, we have two uh, Facebook pages that one is uh, open to all our uh, adult band members. And um, practically, I think we have like a 95% membership of our membership is are part of that uh, group. And it's a closed group. And, um, and we also have... Um, now our members live. Remember, they live across North America, so my constituents aren't all right here. I have members who are in uh, all over Canada and into into the U.S. So the uh, Facebook page really has bringing has brought us together way more than we used to be. Um, information is much more at your fingertips than it used to be. So we provide a lot of uh, updates live. It's live updates where we go and all our community meetings are broadcast live. Wow. So we're talking about stuff uh, like membership, elections, uh, the, our audits. They're all done for community members. No matter where you are in the, in the world, you can pipe in and, and go on that site and watch um, meetings and consultation meetings. And so it, it, we also have a community site. So we don't, like when we put out bylaws, because bylaws are only effective on reserve. So our members who live in California they don't really um, need to abide by any of the bylaws or, or have those updates right at, right at their fingertips. So we have a separate page for our community members and residents, because in order for you to live on reserve, you have to apply to become a registered resident. So when we have memos about garbage pickup, it goes right to our residents and our members. So we have two uh, social media sites that are quite uh, active. And then, uh, so we put a lot of information on there. Uh, we do a newsletter three times a year, and and I'm my I make myself available for questions all the time. So anybody has a question, they can come in and ask. And and I'm we don't hide anything. If you have a question, you may not like the answer, and this is what I tell the band members: if you may not like the answer, but I'll tell it to you the way it is. 
And, um, you know, we, we've had situations where we do a lot of um, survey monkey surveys to find out what, where the community uh, thinks we should be headed and where the, what they think is important. And, um, you know, if we're, if we're looking at uh, um, membership, you know, what, what our rules should be, how we should change them, should we change them? And we do surveys and we, we take the uh, feedback and we, we take it seriously and, and make our decisions based on that. So when uh, someone comes and says, well, why did you do that? And said, well, you know, we looked at what the community wanted and this is kind of what they wanted. So that's the way we went. Or even, even though the community wanted to do this, well, we got some advice, either financial, account, uh, legal, uh, whatever, and we decided we can't do that. And here's why. So we're very, very uh, transparent and accountable to our decisions. Um, Sometimes people are afraid to ask the questions, but uh, we we do our best and you know to 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 put the information out there. I think there's some good lessons in leadership there for our uh, our all of our politicians and, and, <laughs> and leaders, uh, and uh, you know um, we certainly try to follow some of those same principles in the faculty and. And the and the university and you know I, I think it makes very good sense on on the front end you make sure that you're consulting with your stakeholders and then on the back end you're being transparent about uh, the decisions that you're taking so that that makes very good sense. Um, I, I want to transition now to talk about the land claim that we've alluded to a little bit when we were talking about your time in in university and then in law school and and this is really one of the most uh, remarkable aspects of uh, of your career it was is this instrumental role you played in initiating a land claim on behalf of your first nation for the unlawful reduction um, of its reserve uh, size of its reserve and you initiated that land claim in your second year at UNB law and I, I think I read recently that it was it was actually in April, like around exam time when you filed it. Everyone else was studying for final exams, you know, and, and, and here you are trying to make history. Uh, that, that, that's, that's incredible. It, it really was, but it was a passion and it was, uh, I, I, I can't take all the credit. I had a, a colleague who helped me through this, one of the students who graduated with me, uh, Mary Kaldick. She was also uh, quite uh, helpful, and we were students, but we both drafted the legal arguments and uh, submitted them. They didn't necessarily have to be submitted by a lawyer at the time. So we had done the report, the historical report. Uh, we tightened it up and we added the, um, the legal analysis, and we just submitted it. Now, it was quite rudimentary, I have to say. I mean, it was we, we did this not quite knowing the um, the depth of the legal arguments that were going to go into it, but uh, but it, it it was a good start. I mean, we knew that something was not right. Uh, when you look at when you knew a little bit about the law that in order to uh, to get land, there had to be a, a meeting, there had to be a surrender, and there had to be compensation, and none of that was there. There was no evidence of that anywhere. So, and we had looked, I had looked, I had done quite a, a lot of hours in the archives and there was nothing to, to, and, to that, that, and that you discovered when you were working on your independent research project uh, with Andrea Beer Nicholas, is that right? Well, yes and no, because I didn't okay. have any legal training. When I did work with Andrea on the independent study, I, I was actually doing a paper on how the, uh, the government of New Brunswick, the colonial government of New Brunswick was actually favoring indigenous people who who gave up their traditional lifestyle and became farmers and and so the colonial government favored that and and so it was uh, it was my my independent research focused on that but while i was doing that research i did notice because i was focusing on my community and a particular individual my great my great grandfather and how he was favored and so a lot of the history i did was around him and his his leadership in the community. So yeah, it was it was quite. Um, I knew that something was wrong. So when I got into law school in the second year, I knew that 
you know, according to the Indian Act, according to the Royal Proclamation, in order for land to be lawfully alienated, a process had to be in place. And so it was at that point that we did some additional research, didn't find anything, um, and then submitted it based on the, uh, you know, the knowledge we had about the uh, the Royal Proclamation, the Indian Act, and and actually uh, surrendering reserve land. And 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 the the your community's reserve was was reduced in size quite a bit, right? Like, uh, like is it is it two thirds or three quarters or something like that? It was reduced by three quarters. Like the, the original size of the reserve was over four thousand acres, and the reserve now has, uh, you know, when once all the land was unlawfully taken, and it it was it was down to like seven hundred and something acres, and we lost about a thousand acres on the U.S. side in Madawaska, Maine, and and that didn't form part of the claim. So that's something that we're planning on after in the future. Uh, because at this point, Canada didn't want to deal with it in the uh, in the negotiations. Right. So this, in order to, to settle this thing, it took over twenty years. And here you are, a, a law student with a classmate, filing this uh, paperwork. And obviously, you had a lot of conviction and and, and the, the knowledge, you know, that there was an injustice here. Um, but did you ever think that you'd be kind of embarking on this decades-long battle? Like, like, how did, how did you see this developing? Absolutely not. I did not think it would take this long. The longest part was what, when you submit the claim, it just it sat there till an analyst reviewed it and then did some confirmation or additional research, and then they send it off to DOJ and then they determine if there's any more research. So the process, while the claim was in Canada, was almost 11 years. Wow. So we got a, um, we got a, a rejection letter that said, uh, you know, in 2009, sorry, but uh, we didn't do anything wrong because there was never a reserve there to do anything wrong. So the issue then became... When was the reserve created? Because there's currently a reserve here now. And if you looked at some old history books, it would say that we were considered a de facto reserve. Um, we were one of the only de facto reserves. I think there might have been another one in New Brunswick. But it meant that there was no order in council that set aside the land as a reserve. And that it was a de facto reserve because it was always a reserve. But at some point, boundaries had to have been laid out. And so one of the maps that I had found uh, was the uh, survey, a survey plan from the uh, Surveyor General of the province. So the province of New Brunswick was formed in 1984. Three years later, they sent the Surveyor General himself to come and determine the boundaries between Quebec, Maine, and New Brunswick, but also to set aside land for the uh, Frank, uh, Frank, French settlement that was in the area. But it was it was vital that the Aboriginal inhabitants had their land laid out for them first. So if you look at that map from 1787, uh, the reserve was approximately 4,000 acres, and it spanned both the, the Woolastook and the Madawaska River. And it set aside in red ink uh, the area for to be reserved for the Indians. So our argument was that that was the date that the reserve was set aside because the surveyor general under direction of the lieutenant governor had authority to do it. And it was accepted by the indigenous people because the notation said the area outlined in red is reserved for the Indians use. So it's, it was very clear and plain as day. And it was a, there was a board of ordinance stamp on the, on the map, which meant it was a military document. And it was an official document created by the surveyor general himself, not some of his deputies that he often sent out to do other surveys in the province. And um, the funny thing is that document, that map, which is a, an amazing piece of artwork, because not only did this surveyor general have the skill to do the survey himself, but he was an artist. So you have to draw that on a map. Um, but the, the funny thing is that map is nowhere to be found in the province of New Brunswick. It's a New Brunswick Surveyor General's map, but it's being held at National Archives in Canada, 
because a copy was sent to the Quebec General uh, Surveyor General. And then it got put into the National Archives. But the New Brunswick copy is nowhere to be found. And so that just speaks quite a, uh, quite a load to the poor record keeping of the province of New Brunswick. And, and in fact, it, you learn all kinds of side history stories, like one of the surveyor generals by the name of Anthony, Anthony Lockwood was a, a man who kind of went mad. And there's a book about him, uh, a master and madman, because he was a naval officer, but he was also a surveyor general. Well, he went crazy and he was just issuing grants out uh, on the streets of Fredericton, and he ended up being arrested because I think he was running down King Street naked and shooting a gun or what something of that nature. But he was also burning maps and grants. Wow. So, so you know, it's very difficult to find justice when the documents and the proof is not completely at your fingertips. And, uh, and so, so how, did, how did you find that map? Well, it, it's a map that is National Archives of Canada, but they do have it on microfiche in the Provincial uh, Archives. Okay. So when I submitted the claim, and this was another thing, I submitted the claim and I made photocopies of the microfiche and it was all in black and white. But the area outlined in red was reserved for the Indians, but there was no red. So when I submitted it to Canada, that was they never went and tried to find the original map which we knew was at National Archives Canada. So when we went, you know, after after the rejection of the uh, claim, then we d dug in and did some more research uh, to prepare uh, for the, like the tribunal that we, uh, we ended up in, the specific claims tribunal. So, I mean, it sounds to me like not, I mean, there are a number of challenges here. One is the length of time, it just sat there. But then you got all these roadblocks and arguments and, you know, it's not a reserve. It is a reserve, but we can't read the map, you know. I mean, how do you stay um, motivated? Uh, you know, how does that not get you down? It was tough. It was a roller coaster. It was an extreme roller coaster because when we got the rejection, I was crushed. I thought, this makes no sense. The, the justification for Canada was we didn't do anything wrong because there was no reserve there. But then they failed to say when they thought the reserve became a reserve, but there is a reserve here. So it, the, the, it was a one pager with not, not a whole lot of explanation. They don't provide you with the legal opinion. And they basically say, no. Nope. So at the time, of course, I, I was 2009, so I had... I had some experience under my belt and, and I said, no, 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 there's a, there's got to be a way to appeal this. So the only mechanism at the time was the Indian Specific Claims Commission, which was uh, a body you could go to with if Canada rejected your claim for them to do a review and an investigation and then make a recommendation for Canada to revisit it. But when I submitted it to the Indian Specific Claims Commission, they were on the, the road to being dismantled because of the Specific Claims Tribunal. So this was in two, the, the Specific Claims Tribunal Act came into effect in 2008, but it wasn't up and running until 2011. So in the interim, I submitted my, the, the, the rejected claim to the Specific Claims Commission. They came back and approved it for an investigation but then had to return my claim saying we're dismantling in any claim that we haven't started an investigation. We have to give back to you and you have to bring it to the specific claims commission. So that therein again was another disappointment, but I thought, okay, all right, fine. Uh, and so I worked with, uh, with another lawyer, Rick Hatchett, and we, uh, we created a statement of claim and submitted it to the specific claims commission in 2012. So from 2012 to 2017, that's when the claim was in there. And we had to do a lot of preliminary uh, um, preliminary things to get to get through that. And one of the one of the, Canada brought a motion to remove me from the file, saying that I was in a conflict because I had worked for the specific claims branch so that I couldn't uh, be the lead on the claim which was really had nothing to do with the merits of the claim. It was just to get, just to remove me. So I was, uh, you know, the, the lawyer that I was working with, he said, well, you know, maybe you might want to step down. And I'm like, not a chance. 
not a chance I'm stepping down. If I'm not behind this, and I, as I knew the facts, knew the documents like the back of my hand, I was not going to just, just idly step aside. So I pushed and I pushed and we had a hearing for the judge and the judge asked a question during the hearing to Canada. And he said, so you're telling me that you don't want her to be on the file because you're afraid she's going to know what your legal arguments are in defense of this claim. And he said, yes. So the judge said, but aren't you going to present those same legal arguments at the hearing? And he said, yes. So the very next day they dropped the motion. They, they pulled, they pulled it out because it was clear they it was, it, it just seemed so they didn't want me behind that claim. So the next hurdle was they decided <laughs> that that we couldn't add any new legal arguments, even though the claim had been submitted 16 years previously, we weren't allowed to take advantage of new legal arguments that may have, have come to light since that time, which was ridiculous because I said, that's crazy because, you know, their, their um, delay caused all of this to happen. So it's, it's, we should be able to use those legal arguments. And, um, we never ended up having to get a decision because Canada pulled back that motion. And we also wanted to uh, change the scope of the claim because we had done some additional research. They didn't want us to do that. But then again, once again, they tried to get us. Uh, it, it seemed to me that they were just buying time because all of these these um, hurdles, they ended up pulling out anyway. Uh, they had a they had a bit of a difficult time, I think, finding an expert witness. Um, uh, so that was that was also a hurdle. And the expert witness they had was a professor, uh, William Wicken, and and so timing for additional research was around his schedule as a professor, um, and so that that ended up stalling things. So it was five years in the tribunal with a lot of disappointments, but. Um, it was a, it was an, an amazing time uh, to to be able to to argue this because I hadn't done any real litigation before this. I was really just a, a policy lawyer drafting a, a drafter, um, but I was I I knew the facts so well that it was almost impossible for me not to be the lead counsel on this because I I could really uh, question the experts quite quite well and 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 get them um, on their uh, you know, try and discredit them. And, and it wasn't, a, it's not always a fun thing to do, especially with a, you know, a prominent uh, historian like, like William Wicken uh, to do that. But, um, but it, I, I enjoyed it actually. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's amazing. And so, I mean, what, what would you say, because a lot of people who are interested in pursuing justice and have a cause that they, they believe in, uh, you know, they, they they hit these roadblocks, right? And then they get discouraged and it's it's hard. Um, but, you know, you persevered for so long and you were going up against, I mean, um, you know, it, it, it's well known the, the federal government has infinite resources, a Department of Justice with hundreds, if not thousands of lawyers, access to, you know, I, I mean, how do you... Um, yeah, or, or I guess what kind of encouragement would you give uh, someone, you know, maybe in their second year of law school who wants to do something uh, like this, but uh, and, or maybe they encounter their first roadblock and they're feeling doubts. Like what, what advice would you give them? You know, you just never give up. You never give up because if I would have given up I wouldn't be here today because if you know, if you know something is right or wrong, you have to fight for that. You have to fight for justice. And, you know, even after we won the claim in 2017, which was, which was quite a, a day for me. I remember um, having to even, and putting the pleadings in was, was just like up at two in the morning. And, and it was, it was a battle. It was a stress. But, you know, it all came out to the end because the judge, um, he did a fantastic job in writing the decision. And and it was, I was just in disbelief. But then came the negotiation part. And that 
that was another challenge in itself because it took almost three years to to negotiate this. But within a year, we had an agreement in principle, but we couldn't get it. We couldn't get it approved because it had to go to Treasury Board. But then there was an election and then there was COVID. Then there was like everything kind of just seemed to get in the way. And, and Canada was still fighting on stuff. And it got to the point where we went back to the tribunal because I, I was fed up with the negotiations. They were going nowhere. They were not moving. And the judge, when he read the pleadings to go for us to bring the claim back into the tribunal for compensation and not negotiate, he could not believe how Canada had treated us. He said, and and I'll never forget this because he started off our conference by saying, if you were to provide these facts to a person on the street, they would think this is a horror story. And he accused Canada of bad faith negotiating. And it he went up and down, up one side and down one the other side of Canada. And I felt bad for the lawyer because um, you know, I had become friends with them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course, the lawyer can only do what their client tells them to do, which is Canada and Canada refused to to be so um, forthcoming. They were just everything that seemed to be like a spoke in the wheel. And but we finally, finally got it to to happen. Uh, and we got it. We had to go to a referendum with the community and the community voted on the settlement agreement that we had uh, agreement in principle that we had settled. And uh, we did that in during COVID and we did it within a two and a half month period. We got a ratification vote of 98% approval. And it was, it was uh, quite a task, but when you want to do something, you put your mind to it, you can get it done. Canada did everything to stall this. And that's what happened. That's why it took decades when it didn't necessarily have to. So I, I want to ask you in a second about, um, you know, what the what the settlement uh, um, provides for, for your community. Um, but but I also want to ask you about the process, because some people would say, well, you know, Indigenous people should not have to go before a, a crown kind of entity or process. I mean, this is a, you know, a quasi judicial tribunal that you're appearing before, which is created by an act of parliament. And, 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 uh, and so some people would, would, uh, be critical of that as maybe not consistent with, uh, uh, reconciliation. Right. Um, but in, but in this case, it ended up with a favorable, uh, outcome. How do you think about that tension? That's that's a bit of a conundrum because you know you want to use indigenous law, indigenous process um, to you know to to seek justice, but unfortunately, um, that's in a reality. It's it, we're not there yet. I mean, reconciliation has not happened. So we're still in that process. And what what a you know a better way to to beat someone than than the person who wrote the rules. You're you're, you're beating the person who wrote the rules. So but it doesn't always work that way. You're right. I mean, I mean we I knew the law and I knew that this was going to win. And and I played that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the law is right. Like the law may be the law, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right. I mean, laws do change because, you know, and unfortunately it, it took so long and, but I was beating them at their own game, which kind of made it a bit sweeter for me, but that was my own personal um, approach to it. But yes, I understand that people are saying, if you're going to use, if you're going to use an argument, use indigenous law, use the law of the indigenous nation and, and. But it's just a bit harder because it's not as codified. It's not as um, clearly evident as to how that how that would unfold. So it, it's a challenge. If you um, 
you know, obviously this is one land claim, but there are many others um, and, and, and many other disputes over land that, that have to be resolved, uh, you know, in the coming years and, and, and decades. It, do you have any ideas about sort of a, a process, a better process for for dealing with these these types of uh, of, of disputes? Uh, just given your own experiences. Well, you know, negotiations are are always better than any type of adversarial process. So, unfortunately, the parties have to be willing to do that. And therein, therein lies the problem. So there are many claims out there, and, and I'm assuming the um, majority of them are valid claims. Uh, some may not be, and some may not be, may not be worth the effort because, uh, you know, we have other claims where the cost to actually battle a claim could be in the millions of dollars, but the outcome or compensation is less than that because the specific claims doesn't sort of return land. Um, they can add land to your settlement agreement that you would be able to pur- purchase on a you know willing buyer, willing seller basis, but the land in question is never guaranteed to be returned. So, so most of the compensation is is monetary, and therein lies a big problem because a lot of these specific claims they're not title claims, they're not comprehensive claims, they're very specific to an, a lawful a breach of a lawful obligation. The fact to battle them is way more expensive than the compensation or outcome makes it not worth doing. Uh, even though there's a, a, an injustice or a wrong done, how do you go through this sort of system of the uh, specific claims branch to, to get it to get it done right? You can submit it and hope that it doesn't go past that. Just doing the initial research and getting a legal opinion can be quite expensive. And it may not it may not be uh, worth that. So it, it's a bit of a challenge in in that sense. How do you improve it? You just hope that the government can can deal more on a um, on a sort of global type basis. For example, uh, in New Brunswick, the specific claims branch uh, started a, a project where they took uh, Metapanagia and and sat down with them and said, okay, let's go through all your specific claim grievances and look at them on a global basis. And, and that's what they did. And some of the claims were validated and some were not. And so they looked at it as a whole so that that community has now uh, had an opportunity to present all of their claims um, rather than submit a claim here and there and sporadically and take a more more uh, nation approach or global approach or community approach. And, and do, do the First Nations communities have... Um, access to assistance in preparing these things, these claims, or is that part of what the, the specific claims branch pro- that provides some of that support, but do they have their own support or does it really depend from one First Nation to another? It, it depends from one First Nation to the other. You need to have the, the per- you need to have research done. And now they have um, a process where uh, your your submissions have to be meet a minimum standard, and so when you submit a claim to to Canada now, uh, they'll check to see do you have um you know a, a documents a, a list of documents uh, do you have a, you know a proper research do you have a proper legal opinion, and then if you have if you meet all their standards they'll send you back a letter saying you've met the minimum standard for an application. If not, then you have to go back and resubmit. And this is fairly new. Um, and uh, once you do receive a minimum standards letter that you've met the minimum standard, then they have three years to resolve the claim. So things have changed since when it w- we first submitted our claim, as it could sit there forever. There was no time limit, but they do have a time limit now. So let's talk a little bit about the, the, the settlement. So my understanding, and, and I'd like you to explain this for, for our audience. So. Um, some of it makes provision for the addition to the reserve, uh, uh, maybe in the future. And then there's also uh, uh, financial uh, 
uh, amount of 145 million. Can, can can you explain how how that would work? Like, how would land be added to your reserve, uh, and and then and then how are you using the uh, 145 million to uh, improve things in your community? So yeah, so that's a great question. That uh, the the monetary compensation is uh, what we did do is take half of it and we distributed per capita. So this that actually went a huge way in helping a lot of band members, um, you know, pay off debts, make improvements to their homes, um, you know, buy vehicles. Uh, th- start a business, a lot of these, a lot of the community members were able to do so much with this money. Imagine you're, you, you come into a land, a windfall of, of cash, you're, you know, you're going to do good things with it, hopefully. So we know a lot of people in our community, if you take a drive to our community, you can see um, probably 30, 40% have put it on their properties. Um, you know, they've made changes to their, their driveways and you know, added an addition to their home, um, all kinds of beautiful, beautiful work. So if you go through the community, you can see the pride in people's property that they took uh, and put money on their own properties. So that was, uh, you know, that was quite a, quite a, a positive thing. We've also taken a, a large chunk of money and we're putting it in a trust account a legacy trust to uh, provide income for the uh, upcoming generations. And so that's, that's also a great thing that we're doing um, to be able to, uh, to think to the future. So it's not just all given out and that's it. Goodbye. See you no more. And then we have uh, some money left over to do some infrastructure projects, um, economic development projects and to purchase land. So the addition to we, in our settlement agreement, we they agreed to add 1,932 acres, whatever. I'm not sure why they didn't just do a regular 2,000 acres, but that's fine. So we get to add that amount. Uh, there's an, a lawful obligation on their part to add it minimum that amount. We can still add more if it meets in the policy. So <clears throat> if we were to purchase a 2,000 acre lot somewhere and have it added to reserve, we can do that. As long as it meets the additions to reserve policy that the federal government has. So there can't be any um, liens or loans or buildings that have liens or loans on it. There uh, has to pass environmental or a site assessment and all of those things. So it has to, uh, it has to meet their policy. It doesn't have to be directly adjacent to the reserve. It can be anywhere in New Brunswick. Okay. So, and there's no time limit on it. We don't have five or 10 years. It, there's no time limit. So that lawful obligation they've committed to under the agreement is forever until it's completed. So that gives us time to uh, consult with the community. What type of land are you looking for? Are you looking for more economic development land, more residential land, more cultural land, more, you know, so, so we're doing uh, consultations with the community right now to find out what type of land they want to add how far do you uh, would you approve the land to be? You know, because we could we could technically get land all the way down in St. John. Um, you know, we want to keep it within our uh, Willistic Way territory. So where you know where do you see yourself agreeing to this type of land? So we're doing a lot of community consultation, but we're not in a rush because we have no time limit for that. Well, uh, you mentioned economic development, and I want to talk a little bit about that because. Another just amazing part of this story, you mentioned how small your community is, uh, but you've been tremendously successful in, in business, right? So with the uh, with Gray Rock and, and the shopping center and all of that stuff and all the jobs that you've created, both for members of your community and in the surrounding community. Um, what do you attribute that success to like how did all of that uh come about well you know the our location is key so our uh reserve is located uh directly within the municipality of edmonston so the city of edmonston surrounds us um but not only that uh we have the trans canada highway that directly goes through our reserve so the location is key um, so you're right off the highway. You've got people from Quebec coming in, 
They're going to stop there. We're one of the bigger, we're one of the first stops. So our location was definitely key. Leadership in the community goes back to the 70s over, over understanding the, um, the importance of location. So we've had, you know, when you go back into the 1970s, and you look at some documents in our, from our files, we've had some leaders who, who have wanted to uh, get an economic development area going and get all kinds of different things moving. But what really happened was in 2003, when my sister became chief, she made it her mission to get to get that um, area up and running in economic development. And so the very first hurdle we had, because I was a, I came in uh, afterwards and in the, in 2007. One of the very very first hurdles we had was we needed on and off ramps on the highway. So the, even though the Trans Canada Highway divided our reserve, we had an overpass. But we had no on and off ramps. So in order to get clients and, and people to come to our, uh, our, our development, we, you have to have easy on and off access. So that was a big battle. And we used an, a previous grievance that the province, when the province built the, built the local high school, they built it without surveyors and accidentally built half the high school on reserve land. Oh, my goodness. So they ended up having to pay leases over the years so when it got when we asked we tried to negotiate with the province for the on and off ramps they were like no we're not going to do it we're not going to do it so then we finally said okay fine we're shutting down the high school so we went to the the media and we basically said we're shutting down the high school we're gonna it's on reserve land we're gonna cut that that high school right in half we were not very well liked by the ministers at the time um, kids thought we were great, but, um, but yeah, so, uh, there's, a, I know that there's a, a picture of, uh, like, uh, my sister was the chief. I was a counselor and another woman, uh, Brenda Wallace was a counselor. And we were, we had these real mean faces looking and we were looking down at the map, but, but the, the province uh, was forced to, uh, to negotiate with us. Cause so they, we surrendered the land where the school is. So it's no longer reserve land in exchange for additional land and the on and off ramp. So we, we negotiated that. So that was a big process right there. That And then, so then, you know, we had to get a loan for infrastructure because we have 70 acres up there. And, and that was a process because uh, we needed to get a referendum to surrender the land to be able to lease it to non-Native people, non-Native businesses. And, and, and that we had to do a referendum and that just passed by two votes. And so this, this is the gray rock development. Is that this right? is the gray rock development. So yeah. what is, what is it for the, for those who haven't been to your community, like what, what would you find there? Like, uh, oh. what is that? Well, you, there's a, a, a large, um, a tr a truck stop there and there's a, a Tim Hortons in the truck stop and there's like a, a, a pirate to restaurant. We can get seafood. But then we also have a uh, Grey Rock Casino, which is now attached to the Grey um, the Grey Rock the Quality Inn Hotel. We have a strip mall. We have like Dollarama. There's an eyeglasses place, uh, a sports clothing, uh, uh, hunting and fishing store. Um, we have a food court that has uh, four, uh, four um, fast food businesses in there. We have uh, a motorsports small engine place. Uh, Yamaha Motorsports, we have Ford dealership is all on there. And so all the businesses are growing as it's, it's going to be um, it's nine years that we the truck stop opened, which was the first business. And so we just keep completely growing and growing. And we've got a giant tiger that's going up. Uh, back. Wow. Um, yeah, so we have we're in talks with several other businesses to build there. So it's it's a uh, it's a nice commercial place to go and, um, and, and, and hopefully, you know, we're going to continue to build. So it, it sounds to me like you, you and your colleagues and your, your, your sister, um, like you were able to kind of see where your, your strength was right in terms of economic development. So, so you focused on, well, we've got this great location, right? But then you, you had, you had some, some barriers is, is that maybe um, you know a, a model for other 
communities that are looking to uh, to to develop economically is to try to figure out okay like what is our strategic advantage? So for you, it's location. For some other people, it might be you know a, a workforce or or you know natural resources or whatever. Is that kind of the, the the starting point for all this? Is you have to figure out kind of what your advantage is. It it is it is a starting point, but it's not necessarily um, fair because uh, for for a community that's rural. Uh, and it could be a large community, they need to have um, access to property that they can add to reserve for economic development. And so they need to be able to um, strategically. So even though we are lucky that our reserve is already located here, other communities can purchase land and have it added to reserve um, for their economic development. It could be land on the side of the highway. Problem is the province gets very afraid of this. Because the province is thinking, oh, you're taking our tax base land and you're taking it from us. And it's kind of ironic, isn't it? How that they're worried about that. So explain to me, what's the, so, so, so uh, another First Nations community could, could find another spot next to a highway that's for, for, for sale and add it to their reserve. But what would be the barrier to that? The province could object for, for some like on what basis would they would they object? Well, they could they could object based on on loss of revenue. My guess would be okay uh, of that on that basis, because not only is it loss of a tax base for for the province, but it also creates a new jurisdiction, which is where we stand with the tax agreements. The tax agreements are to are put in place to prevent First Nations from asserting jurisdiction. Um, the tax sharing agreements with the province. But now that those are being taken away from us, there's nothing to stop us from doing that. So that creates a bigger fear in the province as to, like, you know, a revenue source. We Those agreements were put in place back in the 1990s. And they were put in place for a specific reason to create a equal playing field for businesses, both on and off reserve. They were done under the Frank McKenna government. And now it, it just that that whole idea has been lost because because of the success that some communities are, are having. It, they're, they're not seeing the, 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 the bottom line, the reason for those agreements in the first place. Um, they are helping helping local the local economies. The municipalities that were, are surrounded by us are completely happy about this. Well, uh, so the other thing that I wanted to ask you about uh, and that you're known for is helping to unite the Wallace Nation in, in New Brunswick. And, um, you know, this strikes me as a huge accomplishment because any time you bring together different communities with, you know, different geographies, different populations, different uh, priorities, right? You know, um, stages of economic development. Uh, you know, how, how did you go about doing that, you, you know, and overcoming some of these differences to have people kind of speaking with one voice on certain issues? You know that was a that was a challenge because um, back when I became chief, there was about there was over twenty five different indigenous organizations in the province. At, well, and some of them were Atlantic, but there's more more or less six five or six that that really w were doing something for the communities, and uh, you know I realized early on that we needed to unite as um, as the Wollastig way. You know, we're six communities in New Brunswick. And if we're going to have a voice, then we're much louder when we speak with one voice. And so after I became chief, uh, the very first thing I did was set up a meeting of all the uh, Wollastig way chiefs to try and reunite the Wollastig way nation uh, together. And we held it here in 2014 in, in our community. 
and it went well. The, 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 the drive to do this and the, um, the willingness of the chiefs to do this was all there. It was just a matter of doing it and having someone spearhead it, having someone organize it, because there was no source of funding to get it started. Now, we had already a bunch of other organizations, uh, the uh, Assembly of Chiefs in New Brunswick, the Union of New Brunswick Indians, there was Maui, there was uh, um, tribal councils. And so, like, I found that it, it's just inefficient. I knew that this was all inefficient. So I constantly would talk about efficiency and strength. If we had one place to go for all of our concerns and issues, you know, the left hand wouldn't be doing, you know, would know what the right hand is doing. So it's really, it's really a matter of um, just spearheading it and getting it done. Everybody knows what the right thing to do is, but who's going to start it? Who's going to go and make that move? And so we, we committed to doing that. And it took some time. Uh, there was some back and forth. There was some like organizations that had to change and that caused some stress, but overall for the, the betterment of the nation, we had to do, we had to do this. And, and the other chiefs realized that too. So it was, it was a process. It was uh, something that I knew we had to do. When you put all the chiefs together, you have 15 chiefs in New Brunswick and nine of them are MIG. And so as a group, if we voted, we would always be outnumbered as the rules to chiefs. So I knew that we had to do something on our own to do what was in our best interest. And so it was important that we build ourselves up and then we can reunite back with the other chiefs in New Brunswick. And we're almost there, I think. We're, we're, we really, over time, built ourselves up to be an organization that's uh, very efficient and and is getting a lot done, um, particularly in light of uh, consultation and accommodation. Interesting. And so, so it is um, what uh, what is the relationship between uh, the Wallastique Nation and Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy? Like, how, how do how does that how do they all kind of work work? Together, are there similar organizations to the Wallastique Nation representing the, the, the Mi'kmaq and the Passamaquoddy, and then they, you, you kind of discuss together on common issues? How does that how does that work? Ideally, that's how we hope it's going to work. Um, you know, we're still like change is is not an easy thing to happen, and um, it, it's taking us time as a Wallastique Nation to build our the confidence in ourselves. And, and to bring forward our specific issues, um, for example, the title claim that we uh, submitted uh, in, in um, December. And, and that was a big step that we moved towards. But, the, you know, those claims overlap, as you say, with the Mi'kmaq and with the Passamaquoddy, and we have, to, we have to work with that. We just don't want the government to come in and do it for us. We need to do these relationship buildings amongst ourselves. And, you know, we're in the process of doing that. And yes, the Mi'kmaq have their own organizations, their, their own priorities. And, um, and so we want to mix these all together through some sort of wampum agreement, which we hope to uh, work on over the next few years. Well, in our last segment, I, I, I um, like to ask you whether you have any advice for for law schools and, and law students. So as you know, the, the TRC report includes several calls to action that relates to, do, to law schools. Uh, for example, having Indigenous peoples and, and the law as a mandatory course, talking about the legacy of residential schools, skills-based training and anti-racism and intercultural competency. We've started taking what I hope are, are meaningful steps in that direction. So we revamped our foundations of law course to include uh, Indigenous perspectives. We appointed Graydon Nicholas, another uh, UNB law grad, as our Wika Dajimid, who's working as a mentor to our students and, 
and to our, our faculty. We, we still have a lot more work to do, obviously, in that regard. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you have any advice for us, like what, what is the most important thing that we can do as a law school to uh, make meaningful progress on, on these calls to action and reconciliation generally? So, I, I mean, I've said this before, I think it's important to you know, you have the 94 calls to action, and some are directed towards government, some are directed toward law schools, some are university and law societies. But these are, you know, these entities shouldn't be working in silos. So if the law school is trying to implement some of these calls to action, it needs to be done in conjunction with universities and with the law society. Um, because you have all these truth and reconciliation committees working in, in like by themselves and do you know like yes you may know what the law society is doing but what is the universities do what are the universities doing and how can you connect that because if 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 it's all about um making law schools a much more welcoming place or trying to recruit more indigenous students into the law school then you really definitely need to be working with the uh, universities and universities need to be working with the department of education and so the line is there to 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 come together and work together in, within truth and reconciliation. But I mean, you, you probably have some sort of committee going. But are is the province involved? Is, is the law society involved? Are the universities involved? And those are that's really where things need to come together to make it happen, to make them all happen. And 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 that's the only thing I can. That's the only real advice I can give for the law school. To is to to broaden broaden the committee to to make sure now I, I at one point i was on the law society truth and reconciliation commission and and it's all about i, I believe that the bar exam should include um a segment on indigenous law and and there's no need to just add a little bit just add a lot and you know, and and i mean we have to learn about uh contract law and family law even though that may not be where we're headed we do need to learn about it, even though. And so that's important that I think every every lawyer or every student has to has to go through that, just like all the other hoops that you have to go through. I think that's really good advice. And I'll give you a practical um, example of this. And you mentioned it, right, recruiting law students. So this is a priority for us. We want to recruit more Indigenous law students, um, but they come from you know, uh, from the universities, from their undergraduate, right? Um, and um, so we, we started we started looking at this a little bit, um, and, and and we noticed that um, while while a lot of uh, indigenous students apply to UNB Law, most of them are uh, coming are applying from outside of Atlanta, Canada. And then the challenge that and we, we really don't have a lot of applicants, indigenous applicants from Atlanta, Canada. So the challenge is that, you know, and this is what our indigenous students are, 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 are telling us and um, is that, well, you know, just like any other law student, they're probably want to stay close to home. A lot of law students stay, stay close to home. So in the case of UNB law students, generally, two thirds of them are from Atlanta, Canada. So if, if we're not figuring out how to attract local Indigenous applicants, we're already two-thirds down in, in terms of recruiting. I mean, the same principle applies. And I don't know if you agree with this, but some people have told me that, you know, uh, with Indigenous students in particular, somehow they sometimes they have particular attachment to their community. And so they they, they, they want to want to stay, whereas that might not exist for a non-Indigenous student. But so we noticed that, and and I think you're right. Like the only way we're going to tackle that is if we deal with, uh, you know, not just the university but high schools, right? And and the Department of, of Education, and and uh, so no, I think that's a, a point well taken, and we have to figure out. And see, the thing is that the challenge is that these different groups are not used to working together. You know, like I wouldn't know who to talk to in the Department of Education because I'm not familiar with, uh, you know, you know, elementary and secondary school education. But I, but 
I think we have to do that. We, we gotta, this challenge is forces us to break down these these barriers, as you say. But you know, we're we're just not used to or set up to working that way. Absolutely, yeah. That's uh, working together. You're going to get farther. Yeah, no, for sure. And how about um, for for law students? I guess I've already asked you this this question, but. Um, when I read their essays, you know, when they apply to law school, most of them talk about wanting to do some social justice thing with their career. And I think most of them are sincere at the time, but then they come to law school and by the end, you know, probably two thirds, three quarters or more are doing something other than what they said they wanted to come to law school for. And that's probably partly legal education is to blame for that. Um, but anyways, I mean, what, what advice would you, would you have for, for, for someone who wants their, wants to use their legal education to pursue uh, social justice, but, you know, for various reasons, in, you know, encountering barriers to that, whether it's legal education or jobs or, or, or what have you. That's a tough one because, you know, sometimes things unfold uh, in a different sort of direction than you would anticipate. And it's the same for me. I mean, when I went into law school, I knew what I wanted to learn. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and that was and that's, you know, that's really where we all end up. Right. And sometimes our choices are made because we need to be self-sufficient. We need a job. So even though, yeah, I'd like to be um, a social justice leader, uh, there's no real jobs out there at this point, so I have to take this other position. And in, then you find yourself um, down a path of, okay, now I've invested in a home and I've got root there, and now I can't change. But, you know, then that becomes more of a life question, right? Uh, it, it's it's difficult. When you're young, you... you you have a, a route that you think you're going to go, but you may end up somewhere else. Um, the only thing I can say for myself in, in at my age is like you really have to look towards being happy and find satisfaction in the job that you do. So if you change, that's fine. If you change your direction, as long as you're happy. I think it's important that that you know, law students are all about success and 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 achieving and but you you've got to put your happiness there. And I think satisfaction, job satisfaction is so important. Your, your last answer leads me into my final question, which has to do with mental health. And we know that there's a lot of mental illness and addiction in the legal profession. And we see this with, with law students, unfortunately, as well. And we're trying to come to grips with that in our faculty in terms of what kind of support that we can provide students. And Oftentimes, what I've noticed is that um, students get um, into, you know, distress or, or, or crisis when they're faced with adversity, right? So there's something unpredictable happens, um, you know, a failure, a loss, or something unforeseen, and 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 sometimes we have difficulty facing that. Um, and, you know, you have such an important job where you're responsible for, you know, the, the well-being of your community and you're, you're dealing with multiple levels of government in these high stakes uh, negotiations and litigation. So, you know, the, you know, we've already talked about it. I mean, you faced a lot of adversity in your career. Do you have any advice for us on, on, on how to cope with those types of circumstances um, so that we stay well and, and happy, as you're, as you're saying is important? Well, I, I'm not really a health, health, mental health professional, but for me, uh, you know, it's really about um, a balance. It's, and, you know, balance is important. In life, you really need to have job satisfaction, and you have, but you have to have time for yourself. You really, and, and I know that the legal profession can be quite demanding, especially uh, quite competitive in trying to find um, 
you know, jobs that are, are high achieving because then you're expected to do a lot. But I think since I've been in law school, the, the, there's been a change. There's been a change in the, in, in the value of mental health and, 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 you know, women in the workforce and, and starting a family and how you balance all of that. Um, but it's, it's important, I think, that we focus on, on the important things. And that's, you know, you can't do your job if you're not healthy. And so you have to, your health has to come first. And, and, you know, for, for, for students that, that can be diff- difficult because especially young, you're, 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 you know, you're on your own, you're, you're, you're not far from leaving your parents' house unless you're, you know, a more mature student going into school. It's just, it can be a challenge and it's not, there's no real one answer for everyone. I think each person has to assess themselves and know what's good for them and what they can handle and not handle. But the minute you feel you can't handle it, that's when you have to take a step back and analyze. Some people can take a lot and take a lot of stress and maybe maybe thrive on that and get a lot of satisfaction off that. And other people may not. So it's really an individual type of uh, advice where you have to self-assess. And self-assessing is not always easy. Um, but it's something that I think it's, it's something that students really should learn how to do where is your breaking point where at what point do you know you're gonna you may not this is the point where you're not going to be succeeding any further because of the stress or everything that's coming down at once so i i think that's so important like one of the things that we've started trying to do with our students particularly our, our incoming students during orientation is to talk to them about well-being as not just a personal commitment, but also a professional obligation. Because as you're suggesting, if you're not well, then you're not exercising good judgment, right? And you can potentially hurt someone, you know? Um, One of the things I do with the incoming students is uh, uh, I talk to them about some of the really sad cases that we see of, of lawyers who are disciplined or disbarred. And a very common story that you see in those uh, decisions is that there are warning signs that something's kind of going off the rails. Maybe it's, you know, something happens that triggers addiction that, you know, triggers some sort of um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, problematic behavior. And, And then it just keeps going and they don't stop, say, well, wait a minute, you know, I need to take a break here and look after myself, deal with this, hand off my files to a colleague, and I got to get better, and then I'll come back. It's good for me as a person, my family. It's also important for my clients and my profession, you know? Um, So we're trying to show the students that those two things are actually together, that if you're not well, you could be, as you say, you could become unsuccessful. So I guess what we're trying to do there is play on law students' kind of obsession with, with yeah, success. Yeah, and make it not seem like it by doing that is a, a fault. It's not a exactly. fault that, that happens. And that's because you, you know, uh, highly motivated people go into law school and, and, and any type of um, self-criticism is seen as a, a fault. And it doesn't have to be that way. You, you, you have to accept it as a reality. Like if you, you know, if your thumb breaks, you got to put a cast on it. And you can't just say, oh, no, I can't have, I've got to, I have to, to, to go on normally. No, no, you have to, you have to take time. And I, and it's the same with, you know, with our uh, stress levels. We have to, to take care of that. And it's not a fault. It's not a, a weakness. No, I, I think it's a strength. I, I, I think it shows good judgment, uh, very good judgment, you know, uh, self-awareness, uh, you know, uh, good character, Right. I mean, these are kind of essential aspects of of lawyering, of successful lawyering. So we're trying to um, uh, promote that kind of uh, uh, approach to to things. And it's always good for our students to hear from someone who has, you know, kind of faced this type of adversity and you're still smiling and motivated and (laughs) all of that. So that's fantastic. Well, I think we've come to the end of our our time. Uh, Chief Bernard, I really want to thank you for 
uh, taking time to chat with me. I really enjoyed our, our, uh, our conversation. As did I. Thank you so much. And thanks to uh, everyone watching the UNB Law Podcast. Our guest today was Chief Patricia Bernard, and uh, we'll have more episodes uh, coming to you soon featuring the remarkable people who are part of the UNB Law community.